Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE here in the Palo Alto studios. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE, with Dave Vellante and our entire team here for the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders Executive Series, part of theCUBE and the partnership with the NYSC Wired community. And Sharam Jamal here, Senior Director of AI at NVIDIA. Been around the block, formerly Broadcom, done a lot of variety of things. Sharam, great to see you, and thank you for coming on this AI Infrastructure's Leaders of Silicon Valley. Great to see you. Thank you, John, it's a pleasure actually. Good to see you as well. And thank you for inviting me. Oh, awesome, yeah, glad to have you. I know, and obviously NVIDIA has chips, they got, and GPUs, they got a lot of software. And the industry now has seeing the perspective and you've seen a lot of the, the technology waves. Right now we're at, we're at a point where software is driving closer to the hardware and the AI infrastructure is optimized all the way down to the machine level, but also abstraction layers up to data. So a phenomenon is hitting. The platform shift is here. Uh, we're seeing it, the market's shifting, products are shifting. And so you're, you're seeing that essentially the old ways of computing, general purpose computing as we call it, is changed, okay? You guys talk about accelerated computing, we know that's happening, but it, it, what is it? Like what is, that, what is accelerated computing in terms of uh, the average individual can understand, we all know PCs, if you're in IT, you got servers, you rack and stack them but now accelerated computing is a new thing. It's not accelerating general purpose computing, it's a category. What, what, how do you explain the difference between the old school general purpose computing and the new accelerated computing? That's a great question. That's a great question, John. So, I mean, look, uh, traditional general purpose computing is like a Swiss army knife, right? Uh, it can do many things, but none of them extremely do well. Uh, it's a one size fits all approach where the same process processor is used for various tasks from uh, browsing the web to editing videos. Uh, X rated computing, on the other hand, is like a specialized tool. Uh, it's designed to do one thing exceptionally well. Uh, it uses custom built hardware like uh, GPUs or, or TPUs, uh, which stands for tensor processing units, to accelerate specific tasks such as machine learning, uh, scientific simulations, and data analytics, et cetera. So this leads to significant performance boosts, uh, energy efficiency, and cost savings. And also actually there are three concepts as well from a GPU, from a general purpose computing, right? And those are like, you know, I'm, I'm going a bit technical now. So there are like CPU centric, uh, sequential processing and versatility. So what is CPU centric? CPU centric means that you rely mainly on the central processing unit, which are designed uh, to handle a wide variety of tasks, but often one at a time. Uh, sequential processing is where CPUs excel at sequential processing, uh, making them suitable for tasks requiring complex control functions, uh, but not optimal for data intensive operations. And then they're versatile, it means like general purpose computing can uh, handle a broad range of applications, uh, but may struggle with high performing tasks due to uh, limited parallel processing capabilities. Whereas on, X, whereas on the other hand, the accelerated computing has three main, also three main uh, concepts like, you know, the heterogeneous architecture, uh, the parallel processing and efficiency. So what's the heterogeneous architecture? Uh, combining CPUs with specialized accelerators like GPUs and TPUs to handle specific types of workloads more efficiently. That's a heterogeneous architecture for in the world of accelerated computing. And then you have parallel processing. Uh, like for, uh, GPUs, for example, have uh, thousands of cores designed for parallel processing, making them ideal for tasks like uh, AI training and data analytics. And then is the efficiency. I mean, accelerated computing can process uh, large quantities of data, much faster than traditional computing, uh, leading to significant performance improvement and uh, energy saving. So that's how I would describe the difference between general purpose computing and the X-rated computing. 
I mean, you're in the product management side. Obviously, AI systems is hot. We're seeing accelerated computing as one component, but it's also, there's things around the chips and the software. What, what is the AI application demand? And why is it not, why, why isn't traditional computing models sufficient for some of these new AI applications? Obviously they have intelligence, you see tokens. These new AI systems are designed differently than other systems in the past. What, what, what in the AI applications specifically do you see that become requirements for this new AI system clusters, if you will? Um, I mean, so so basically, I mean, um, I can actually, so maybe actually we can, what we can do is we can maybe perhaps like break down the questions specifically. Maybe what we can do is that first we can, uh, you know, take, okay, that the new AI systems, what are the use cases? Like what kind of impact would they bring on like on, for an average user, right? Mm -hmm. So we can we can start with that, and then you know we can see like you know, and I can answer the second part of the question as well. Right. So specifically, I mean, if you look at the uh, accelerated computing, it imp it will impact. I mean, it is impacting. I would say a lot of impact, but it is impacting individuals in various ways, and often behind the scenes. For example. You know, if you look at faster and more accurate image recognition in self-driving cars, uh, medical diagnostics, uh, social media apps, uh, you're looking at uh, imp uh, improved virtual assistants like, uh, for example, Siri, uh, Alexa, or uh, Google Assistant that can understand and respond to voice commands more effectively. Uh, you are looking at more enhanced gaming experiences with more realistic graphics and uh, physics simulations, right? And you're looking at more, um, uh, you know, more personalized product recommendations uh, from an e-commerce perspective. And then, you know, you can do more efficient and secure online transactions, right? I mean, so basically you can do faster and smarter applications with the X-rated computing, uh, you can enhance the healthcare uh, by air-powered diagnostics. Uh, you can also improve entertainment as well. And, you know, then there's smarter home devices as well, right? Uh, that was the first part of the, like, how I would impact. Now, I think, I mean, the 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 second part of the question, right? I mean, I think you said, like, what what is made of, like, what is exactly, like, of the AI, uh, is the accelerated computing made of, yeah. if I actually... Yeah, what are, these, what, are these, what are these ACE systems configured for? Obviously, the GP, the role of advanced GPU architectures play a big part of it. What are the AI systems looking like right now? Because there is a lot of training data, inference is hot right now as well. It's going to continue to be there. What, what do you see there in terms of the role of advanced GPU architectures playing it? And, and, and shaping, what are these AI workloads in the clusters? What do these clusters look like? Okay, well, I mean, but you, it's an interesting thing. You, 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 you brought in like, you know, training and inferences, right? So specifically, maybe I can actually maybe also kind of like, you know, uh, try to actually focus more uh, uh, light on, you know, what are the fundamental difference between training and inferences in AI? And, you know, the, like the way I explained general purpose computing and, yeah. and the difference between GPU. So uh, I'll give you, I'll start with an example. So imagine you're trying to recognize uh, different types of animals and pictures. And training is the process of teaching a machine learning model uh, to recognize these animals uh, by showing it many examples and adjusting the model's parameters until it becomes accurate, right? Uh, now, this is a compute intensive process uh, that requires large amounts of data uh, and processing power. So that's the training piece. Uh, the inference piece, uh, on the other hand, is the process of using uh, the train model to recognize animals uh, in a new and unseen, and, and, and recognizing a new and unseen pictures, right? Now, this is a less compute intensive process uh, that can be done in real time using knowledge, using the knowledge the model gained uh, during training, right? Now, 
this is a fundamental difference, right? Between the uh, inference and the training, right? And that is actually what plays an important role, uh, you know, of like these AI systems. Now, the uh, the other thing, I mean, and of course, like if you can ask me if that's not clarified, but I think the other thing which you might ask or which I think I would anticipate the next question would be is that, you know, which one of them will become dominant in the future? And I think that, you know, that since like right now inference will, I mean, so based on like, you know, what I see, I think inference will become a dominant use case. And, but training will still be necessary because you need to update models to adapt to uh, changing distributions. Uh, you want to move, you want to improve model accuracy and robustness. Uh, you want to develop new models for uh, emerging applications. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically, you know, it's more like, a, uh, I would say like the training S curve to flatten as models become more efficient and specialized and techniques like transfer learning and few sharp learning becomes more prevalent. So yeah, great. That's, awesome. That's how we'll see. Well, one of the things we're seeing, obviously, you know, we see all the time in the industry, all the big, large language models, there's like four big players doing it. They got all the GPU stacked up, Meta, AWS, all the big, big companies providing that horsepower. In the, the outside of that, there's been a rise of people recognizing that the data is proprietary. I want to maybe have it on-prem, bring an LLM to me um, in, on, on premise or at the edge. So this notion of specialty models emerge and we're seeing small language models, some call, I think we call that, we're the first ones to kind of coined that term on theCUBE year, over a year and a half ago. A small language model doesn't have to be big or a specialty model could be big, but proprietary or intellectual property from someone Clearly, some people call it private AI, sovereign AI, whatever. It's got names, but it's 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 owned, but it's small, smaller owned or small in public. What does that look like? Because we're seeing that a power law is developing in these models, where and they're all multimodal. So you have the big ones, and then they got a long tail. These specialty models have value, and how do you see that playing in with the LLMs? Because one thing that seems to be connecting, the dots are connecting on, is, is that models can talk to each other and be integrated. Um, how do you see that and how does AI systems deal with that or how do you view that? Because in a way, if I have a model, I, I should be able to integrate it with other ones because maybe it's smarter, maybe I do things with it, maybe I share. How do you see this, uh, these specialty models or small language models looking like and does that play well with the, the, big, the bigger LLMs? Yeah, so I think, I mean, you, you have to understand that, you know, first, you know, small language models and speciality models are designed to perform uh, special tasks like uh, language translation, uh, sentiment analysis, or uh, question answering with high accuracy and efficiency. Now, these models are often, often smaller and more energy efficient than large language models, uh, making them suitable for edge devices or uh, resource constrained environments. Now these sm small language models and and uh, specialty models, or you can call them, can complement LLMs in several ways. So one is the hierarchical learning, right? So small language models uh, can be used as building blocks for LLMs, allowing for more efficient and effective training. Uh, the second thing is uh, domain adaptation, right? The specialty models can be fine-tuned for specific domain or tasks, while uh, LLMs can provide a more general foundation, right? And then you have the third piece is that you have the model assembling, right? So combining the predictions of small language models and LLMs uh, can lead to improve overall performance and robustness. Mm -hmm. So basically the emergence of small language models and speciality models it highlights the need for uh, more diverse and 
uh, specialized AI models, which I mean can be used in conjunction with large language models to uh, achieve uh, better outcomes. So yeah. that's how I would actually, you know, that's what how I see the difference. You know, Shiram, Dave and I were talking on our podcast last week around, um, you know, we always talk about, you know, historical, during the web, it was all about the consumer, uh, consumer, and then the enterprise lagged significantly and, and then kind of caught up. In this wave, in this shift, the enterprise is right behind the consumer. I mean, the consumer, you can clearly see the consumer benefits and the consumer products being done. All the LLMs, multimodal, all good. A lot of horsepower, like you said, a lot of training. Inference going to come on, reinforced learning going on next, robotics. I mean, the trajectory of that is obvious. Um, and it's going to get better, faster, and it's going to require huge horsepower, hence the big, the big players and the big GPU pools and clouds are building. Now the enterprise AI, it's like right behind it. We're seeing demand for private AI, again, whatever you want to call it. As you look at the private AI or the enterprise side of the market, this is going to be a data center replacement, if you will, where semiconductors and the infrastructure will be rethought through because you know, enterprises can run things on, on a small machine. If it's a small model, doesn't have a lot going on, but it's the overall workloads in the company, seeing um, cloud on premise and edge the data centers will get retooled. I mean, again, the old days was rack and stack. As enterprises sh shape their AI and as the suppliers who supply stuff to the enterprise, I mean, all the, all the vendors are talking to each other. So there's a lot of good stuff going on. How do you see that evolving? Because heterogeneous, but yet purpose built as can be coexisting. How do you see the enterprise AI going out as someone who's you know, looking at the AI products that are emerging from your perspective? and seeing kind of what's around the corner. What's the AI enterprise look like to you? I mean, what are some of the things that people should be thinking about? This is what yeah. everyone's talking about, because it's, it's, it's the same game, but a whole new applications layer. <laughs> it's a system, yeah. system architecture. Yeah, so what I, understood, what I understand from your question is that, uh, you know, if I were to summarize it, like what about the emergence of private AI and where does that go yeah. and what are the prerequisites of building enterprise AI? Would that be a, yeah. a good summary? Yeah, that's good. That's exactly, yeah. Private AI, enterprise, what, what, what's the requirements? Okay, so, you know, private AI refers to the development uh, and deployment of AI models uh, within an organization's own infrastructure, rather than relying on public cloud services uh, now, this approach is gaining traction due to concerns around uh, data security, uh, compliance, and uh, customization. Now, to build enterprise AI, the prerequisites would, would include are that you need to have a clear understanding of the business problem or the opportunity AI can address uh, access to relevant high quality data and the ability to integrate it with existing systems. Uh, then the third would be that you want to develop uh, the development of a more robust data governance uh, framework uh, uh, to ensure data quality and security. Uh, and then the fourth piece would be uh, investment in, you know, in AI uh, talent of the workforce and, and training or partnering with AI vendors, um, et cetera. And uh, yeah, and then you need a well-defined strategy for deploying and maintaining AI models in production. You know, sure. So okay, that's, continue. Hmm? no, I mean, so, so this is, this is how, I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the emergence of private AI and the prerequisites for enterprise AI, in my mind, are shipping up. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of people see the value of the private, protecting their data. The demand is clearly going to come around fast for uh, AI demand. It's going to evolve. How, how can the semiconductor innovations keep pace to support the scalability and complexity of the clustered systems that are emerging? Because you're seeing a lot of action, you know, stack chips, all kinds of new things. What's your view on the innovations in the semiconductor area that needs to keep pace 
What are some of the things happening that need to continue? And then when that happens, we're in a good spot. What do you see? I mean, I think, I mean, uh, if I would see, of course, there are a lot of innovations happening, but I think the way, I mean, I would like to actually answer this question would be that, okay, more from a specifically that, okay, uh, with the changing AI workloads, you know, what advancements do we need uh, from an energy efficiency perspective, right? Um, so, I mean, as AI workloads are getting more complex and there's a growing demand for AI workloads, um, there could be advancements in specialized hardware like accelerated computing. Uh, when I say accelerated computing, I mean like the GPUs, the GPUs, and the ASICs designed for energy sufficient AI processing, uh, more efficient algorithms and uh, software frameworks that minimize energy consumption, um, increased adoption of cloud computing, which can optimize uh, resource utilization and reduce waste, and uh, uh, you know development of new materials and technologies like uh, photonic interconnects and uh, 3D stack processors. Yeah. Right now, to sustain, ensure that you know we have uh, uh, you know a sustainable energy for the AI future. Uh, you know maybe. Uh, the the governments and industries um, investing in renewable energy sources, like for example, like nuclear energy, like which we talked about as well, could be like awesome, right? Yeah. Or solar or wind power. I mean, um, uh, development of uh, more energy efficient data centers and cloud infrastructure, uh, 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 research into new more uh, sustainable materials and uh, manufacturing processes for AI hardware. Um, uh, you know, encouragement for responsible AI development practices like uh, reducing model size and complexity. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's that's what that's what I see. Yeah, and all kinds of interconnect and dance as well. I mean, it's going to get better. Um, what I want to ask you on, on to shift gears to, to kind of wrap up a bit here, Jerome, is on a personal note. You know, you're in the middle of all the action, right? You're seeing everything. A lot of folks out there that are looking at opportunities, you know, we came out of the interviews we had today around the idea of kernel development. People got to get down and dirty and the best, uh, some of the best uh, successes are people coding closer to the silicon and the silicon having software. So it's not just your old school ecosystem of semiconductor and their part, normal partners. You start to see software become part of that ecosystem, enabling like almost like classic ISVs, but they're not ISVs, they're just coding as close as possible to the physical layer. Um, and we, we're seeing that. We're seeing that the software part of the system around the, the, uh, the chips enabling developers. So it's almost as if it's been an ice age of people frozen in time. We haven't seen kernel developers that, in a while. They're all now kind of an old school, but you're seeing a demand for that kind of like low level coding in the, in the general market. So as, as supercomputing gets democratized with these systems, I think the app developer market is going to probably move down down to the lower in the stack versus higher in the stack. Do you agree with that? And two, what is the ideal direction for either a young computer science person going into school, coming out of school, someone redirecting their career to really get their hands dirty or bite their teeth into some problems to solve? What would you, how would you uh, talk to that person and, and this scenario? Do you, do you agree with it? And if not, what, what do you see it? Yeah, so I think I mean look two things. Like so, uh, if I look at kernel development, you know, it's a is a critical component in the AI and accelerated computing ecosystem. Uh, a kernel, I mean, if you would see what it is, it is a small, uh, optimized piece of code that runs on a GPU or other specialized hardware, performing a specific task such as uh, matrix multiplication, et cetera. Uh, and kernels are the building blocks of the AI and high performance computing applications. Uh, and they enable the efficient execution of uh, complex algorithms on parallel architectures, 
right? So basically, in a nutshell, if I were to say, uh, you know, what is the kernel? What was the role of kernel development? It's primarily three things, right? Uh, one is optimizing the performance. Second, uh, enabling the uh, parallelization. And the third is uh, providing uh, portability. So when I say optimizing performance, you know, kernels are optimized for specific hardware platforms, uh, ensuring uh, maximum performance and energy efficiency, right? Uh, and when I talk about parallelization, what I mean by that is that the kernels will allow developers to harness the uh, power of parallel processing, uh, enabling uh, uh, faster execution of uh, computationally intensive tasks. And then the portability pieces, uh, you know, that kernels can be used across multiple platforms, uh, making it easier to deploy AI and high performance applications uh, on different hardware uh, configuration, right? Uh, so that is, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, um, uh, I would, uh, uh, you know, answer this, uh, you know, the role of kernel in, um, you know, AI, you know, in AI and uh, accelerated computing applications. It's awesome time, Sharon. What are you most? I should make, let me say this just differently. What are you? What and are again, you, I think the second. Sorry, I mean, before I forget. Because I think you asked the second piece of the question as well for the students, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, That's an important one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, yeah. So look, I mean, if you if anybody wants to pursue a career in AI and accelerated computing, I mean, I would, I mean, I would say like five things. Okay, so building a strong foundation in math and computer science, uh, stay up to date with industry trends and breakthroughs. Okay. Um, you know, gaining practical experiences like in hackathon or coding uh, challenges, et cetera. And, you know, and explore inter interdisciplinary connections, right? And then develop soft skills. So let me actually expand on like, what do I, what do I mean by these five things? So, you know, math and computer science means like you need to understand the fundamentals of linear algebra, first linear differential equ equations, uh, second linear differential equations, calculus, probability, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, Python and C++, et cetera, right? Yeah. And then you also need to see what's going on in industry. Like, for example, like, you know, follow, like, you know, uh, uh, webinars, like, follow, like, webinars like these uh, and publications to stay current with the latest advancements in AI and accelerated computing. Um, uh, third, uh, gaining practical experience. Uh, participate in hackathons, scoring challenges and projects that involve AI and accelerated computing to build hands-on experience. Um, and then, you know, also uh, explore the interdisciplinary connections, like recognize that AI and accelerated computing are connected to various fields. Uh, for example, physics, biology, and economics, and explore these connections to broaden the understanding. And then, you know, it's the developing the soft skills, you know, cultivating strong communication, uh, collaboration and problem solving skills. Uh, um, and, you know, so that, that we, these are the five things which I would advise these, you know, students to pursue to have a successful career in AI accelerated, AI and accelerated computing. It's funny how you brought up the math and crossover, say autonomous theory, computer science, machine code. Math is highly correlated. You mentioned some of the soft skills. Could you point to some of the interdisciplinary, well, not soft skills, interdisciplinary skills that might match well? Um, I've always remember talking to folks in the, some of the data science area. Oh, music people love, do well, or you know, <laughs> archaeology majors tend to gravitate towards that. Is there is there an interdisciplinary thing that you see that complements the computer science math piece, uh, or is it just random, just individually based? Yeah, so two things. I mean, you, of course, you asked about the uh, communication uh, skills piece of it, right? So, you know, when I when I actually, uh, you know, for example, talk about, uh, you know, communication skills or soft skills, I would say, the soft skills are like, you know, communication skills, uh, uh, like, you know, the, the ability to comp explain complex um, technical concepts to non-technical stakeholders, right? That's that's like you know breaking down the problem in uh, in a simpler way. 
And then collaboration, like, you know, how do you work effectively with cross-functional teams, including like, you know, like in school or in college, you know, how do you work with different people? And then problem solving skills, right? I mean, to break down complex problems into manageable parts, like identifying key challenges, uh, developing creative solutions. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I think time management, you know, uh, the ability to prioritize tasks, manage time effect effectively and meet deadlines. That's what I meant by like, you know, uh, soft skills. Uh, now, uh, you know, like, for example, the other piece you asked was on the uh, uh, interdisciplinary connections, right? And, you know, uh, like, you know, how AI and security computer are connected to these other fields, like, such as, like, uh, you know, I would I would just say more on the uh, material sciences, which, would, I mean, uh, I don't know if architecture would belong in a material sciences. No, I don't think so. There's a, it's, a, it's a separate field. So I would start with like, you know, like, okay, physics, you know. So AI is used in, uh, uh, in, in particle physics to analyze large data sets uh, and identifying patterns while accelerated computing uh, is used to simulate complex uh, uh, physical systems such as climate models or material science. Uh, if you look at biology, uh, AI used is in bioinformatics to analyze uh, genomes and genomic data, uh, while accelerated computing is used to simulate complex biological systems such as protein folding or uh, molecular dynamics, etc. Uh, in uh, economics, it is actually AI is used in more econometrics to analyze large data sets and identifying patterns, while uh, accelerated computing is used to simulate complex economic systems such as uh, financial modeling or risk analysis, right? Uh, and then, you know, and of course, I mean, the list can be pretty higher, but I mean, if I were to say the last on my list would be uh, uh, environmental sciences, which is like, you know, AI used to analyze large data sets related to climate energy, while accelerated computing is used to simulate complex uh, environmental systems such as ocean currents or weather patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, uh, yeah, so that's, that's that's what I um, I mean by that. Well, Sean, great to have your knowledge sharing here on the community. Appreciate you. It's an inaugural, it's an inaugural event. Uh, Silicon Valley AI leaders and in infrastructure. Obviously, you are one. You're the chief director of AI at Nvidia. Also, your personal experience in the industry have been great and great insights there. Thanks for participating in our in our program. Hey, thank you, John. It's a pleasure, Doctor. Thank you so much. All right, no problem. Thank this you. is the Q here in Palo Alto, California, for the Silicon Valley. AI interest leaders with theCUBE and NYSC Wired Community. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.